We're getting into a technology conversation this morning and our guest is already seated and um, Bernard Wanjao, before I tell them who you are, I'm just going to say good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Karibu sana to the hot seat of the, of the Situation Room. Thank you very much. Uh, Bernard is the Data Center Solutions Specialist at Dell Technologies Southeast Africa. And it's good to have you here because we'll be having an AI conversation. AI, you know, it could have, if we're talking about cattle, it would be one thing. <laughs> but we're talking about technology, so it's another thing. Artificial intelligence, buzzwords that have been around our space for the last decade or so. And probably more pronounced after folks sat in some kind of uh, silos uh, when uh, COVID did its thing. And then when the world opened up, this thing blew up and everybody was everywhere doing things. And so we're getting into that conversation today and we're looking at... Um, AI and machine learning solutions. So there are learning solutions and looking at how Dell Technologies is championing some of those. As we get into that, because it'll be a fun conversation, you know, hang on and seat belts, make it. absolutely, <laughs> seat belts on because it's going to be a fun ride here um, as Bernard walks us through some of these things. But before we do that, uh, CT always uh, has a proverb from a different country every week okay. and uh, he's taking it away. Yes, the whole of this week our proverbs will be from the country of DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. You inherit from the dead, not the sick. Okay, profound. Yes, what does it mean to you? How would you interpret this, brother? Well, okay, so um, first of all, good morning everyone. Mm, good morning. Um, it's really good to be here. I'm an avid watcher of mm. you, by the way. So, um, really great pleasure to join you here today. Asante, you and are home. Yeah, well, feels like it. Yeah. Uh, the city is a bit warm, mm. so I'm sure it's, it's, it's probably an indication of how it's going to be. <laughs> 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 but I don't mind the heat. It's cold outside. Mm. Um, so, this, this saying, this proverb, I think is... Um, has several dimensions mm. so I'll, I'll kind of just interpret it how it how i see how i hear it now mm. and also try and align it to maybe something we are going to be discussing today about <laughs> really determining the real state of things yes right? yeah so my first take of it is that it's not over until it's over mm. don't start counting probably your eggs chickens and until chickens. Are chickens or whatever the case may be don't a, and it can be a double-edged sword. I think inheritance is typically seen as gaining something good, mm. property, wealth, but also it could be inheriting, I think, also problems that are not <laughs> solved. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. So that careful what you, in death. what you might be looking forward to or maybe not. Mm. Um, so, uh, but it's not over until it's over. Now, there's another angle to this, which I think then comes into how do you determine when that state changes, mm. right? Sick and Too passed death. away, dead. That sometimes is also controversial. And we are saying today some of the technologies that are coming to bear are helping humans mm. to be able to make some of these decisions, really decision-making mm. capabilities, enhance our decision-making capabilities. Because without getting too uh, into the medical field, sometimes people are declared dead before they are. <laughs> so, Actually dead. It's yeah. Like real dead. But then we have systems that yeah. could potentially be able to assist those kind of situations. So, I mean, we can look at it. Probably can speak about it half an hour into all the dimensions on this. But If Segway, <laughs> if Segway was a man, it would be Bernard. Oh, fantastic. I like the way he's just gone into that. Uh, CT's handing out points, you know, a million points. <laughs> do, do with them what you want. <laughs> Purchase what you ten, like. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the beauty uh, of asking for someone's opinion, it's not possible for them to be wrong. Because they've just given us the opinion and the understanding of it. Mm. And so it's correct. So if it were right. an exam and it was out of 10, you'd get 10. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Every once in a while, you have people who actually exceed the 10. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. But those are usually on the way to writing a book. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know, it reminds me of back in the day when we used to do compositions. <laughs> and I remember my English teacher in high school telling... Uh, uh, in, uh, teacher primary. of English? Yes, thank you. You're a teacher of the English oh, language. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I was I, I, one I, such person, so... I, I didn't get an A in English. I, I understand. So. <laughs> <laughs> you were close, but why? not there. <laughs> but they said you can never get 100% in composition. Yeah, they say. It's still and now, I, apparently. I was very confused with yeah. that. It, it didn't... I've never reconciled that because it's my story. Yeah. Yeah. It is how that teacher was taught... <laughs> It is. And pedagogy, as we know it, sometimes can be limiting. Mm. The truth of the matter is, if somebody told a story that was uniquely theirs, there's no reason why they should not have gotten 10 out of 10. Indeed. <laughs> Solutions uh, yes. is what we're looking at today. Um, artificial intelligence, when it made its debut on the world stage, is said to be something that was going to present solutions across sectors, um, whether it was in research, whether it was in education, whether it was in governance. I mean, it was seen as this one time panacea for everything. So maybe as we get into this um, and what Dell Technologies is actually doing and what the world is expecting let's just start from a very, very basic again i think it's important when we talk about artificial intelligence and now we're looking at learning solutions artificial intelligence essentially intelligence that is cooked up by a human artificial what are we talking about here okay what is artificial intelligence mm. so um there are various ways of describing this and one of in my so far in my career i've been in it for just over 20 years now mm. um working in various capacities starting from technical serv uh, technical support uh, into services and then into the more the engineering or the solution designing uh, and um, that kind of field which is uh, which is where i am today from a specialist perspective mm -hmm. One of the things I've learned during that period, I'm getting to your question, is listen and also keep it simple. Now, it, there's always a, change, a, a challenge, City would probably attest to this, but keeping it simple means you need to understand it. <laughs> <laughs> you are so very right. Right? Yes. So, you are so, so very right. So, yes. so AI can be described in very technical terms, but I'll try and keep it simple here. Yeah. And I would say it's basically... Um, using technology to enhance how uh, machines, devices, interact with humans. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, that interaction has been traditionally quite, what we'd say, basic, whereby the machines do mechanical work, the humans kind of instruct them on what to do, programming, mm -hmm. coding, things like this. And they're going to do th various uh, activities, right? Uh, various tasks, typically mechanical tasks. The human is going to be the one to do the decision making and the thinking. So now, what artificial intelligence um, is really intending to do and what we are really gunning for, and we are really making a lot of strides in that area from an IT industry, is to change that into actually machines mm -hmm. themselves or the systems themselves doing the decisions mm -hmm. and more and more even the thinking so we're already quite a bit in that direction mm. and there are many examples and i'll try and keep this as practical uh, meaning giving practical examples of some that the public may not be aware is yeah. happening and yeah. some that are quite obvious in terms of this is what's happening today because it's in the social media as it's trending and all that so yeah. telling a machine to do the thinking for you mm -hmm. why <laughs> Well, it turns out, do <laughs> mm. that um, we've known uh, that um, machines, computers, even calculators, let's say even when we were kids and, yeah. you know, and even now, are able to do specific things much better than we can, faster than we can. Um, take a lot of data and analyze it. Mm -hmm. Take a lot of numbers and add them, divide them and manipulate them, right? Uh, your Excel document, your Excel uh, uh, program from Microsoft, yes. right, which is a partner for Dell, is able to do a lot of things for the last decade, decade and a half. Uh, you know, um, uh, amazing things. In fact, they say we're only using about 
typically 5% of its capabilities, mm. right? Because it's, we, you know it can do a lot, but you have to instruct it on a lot of things. Yeah. And sometimes you need special skills, special language to be able to instruct it or not to do so macro language and things like this. Not many people have that. What if you could just describe in human language, in English, mm -hmm. what exactly you're looking for? And then it oh, gives on. you that hold on, presentation, mm -hmm. okay. these charts and all those kind of things. All right. <laughs> so what you're telling me essentially that where we are going with technology and what it will be able to do, learning solutions, because usually, you know, you go for the interview and they say, okay, what office can you use? You say, yes, I know how to do, I can use Word, I can use an Excel, I can do whatever, whatever. Yeah. But what you're saying now is essentially with this technology, for example, I have a thousand people in my database and I want to categorize them according to who are my clients, who are my prospects and who has paid, who has not paid kind of thing. You're saying that we can get to a point where I speak to a machine and I say, um, categorize my clients for me according to A, B, C. And this machine essentially in terms of a solution will give me a file where all of these categories have been done. That's exactly right. And in fact, I'll take it a step further. Mm. Let's say you actually have described your business mm. and your objectives, your KPIs, your um, targets. Mm. And then you have this system that you have deployed within your organization. Let's call it a model, right? A model basically is... Um, what I'll describe is basically uh, a, a way the machine understands your environment and is able to produce particular types of outcomes, mm -hmm. right? But then you have described your uh, objective for your business in, in, in summary. You give it a bunch of data. Without you having to say, I want to see one, two, three, it may actually be able to give you the key information that you need to extract from there and even recommend what your marketing plan should be, your product enhancements, the sentiments in the market about your organizations and the services it's producing mm -hmm. um, or providing to the, to, the, to the users because it's able to collate all this from social media and this, it's able to, to bring all this information together in a coherent way that now it's making decisions or let's say recommendations for you to do one, two, three mm -hmm. as your biggest impact actions. Mm -hmm. This is where we're getting at now, which um, um, e even if you look at it from, a, from let's say a different perspective, um, we have autonomous vehicles today mm. on the roads, yes. not in Kenya, but they are there. They, I mean, everybody knows about this either personal vehicles that are autonomous or even taxi services that are doing this or a taxi will come and pick you up and there's no driver in it yes it will make the decision how it needs to get to the location you need to go to uh fastest you don't need to think about it you don't need to instruct it it will make decisions along the way according to what it's seeing um those are decisions that it's making and really at the end of the day you're entrusting those that are riding in it and mm -hmm. trusting their lives into it. Businesses are going to be doing the same. And in fact, um, many of them are already doing it, including media houses. And we'll talk about that in a moment in terms okay. of use cases. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, when you talk about the self-drive cars, I've always argued from a legal perspective in terms <laughs> of liability. Um, <laughs> who do you then sue because there was no driver? Do you sue the car? Do you sue the software? Or the manufacturer? Do you sue the manufacturer? Who? Who exactly is liable in such an instance? But I think that's a question of now AI manufacturing software liability. Absolutely. The legal conundrum that that creates. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. But mine was on actually security and data protection. Okay. You um, have a machine that is churning out information that is more or less driven by itself because now it has lunch, it has understood what you want as a company. Mm -hmm. So it is giving you the information you need and it assumes you need. Yes. So at what point do we then consider security, privacy? Um, we don't have a situation where potentially now that could be manipulated mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it is its own system. So how do you factor that in? That's a very good question. In fact, f uh, let me first of all appreciate your angle about the legal aspect of it. That is 
to put it simply, work in progress because okay. there are really liability questions. Liability, um, uh, it, it's a conundrum in some cases. Um, somehow, some jurisdictions have found a way around it, um, whereby the the organization that is deploying this technology is taking that liability, but also um, they're also arming themselves to ensure that they're limiting their risks as well. So there's a lot of monitoring, uh, everything is recorded because sometimes fault can be outside of the system. So they need to actually be able to also identify that and be able to defend themselves. So there's a lot of that aspect of of care and auditing and logs and all that kind of stuff, right? However, so AI doesn't exist by itself mm. as an island. It's actually a combination of various systems, which include the security stance of how you manage your data. Mm. And that management of data is how you collect it. What is it you're collecting, right? Because there's also privacy aspects to this. Yeah. Um, then how is it being processed to the point where it now can be used by the model to be able to generate? You know, we, have, we talk about garbage in, garbage out. Yes. And we've seen various alterations of this, iterations of this kind of uh, situation where we talk about hallucinations and <laughs> things like this on yeah. the chat bots, like, mm -hmm. you know, the ones that are out in the market today. Um, an example of one, I don't know whether CT was the last time you used a chat box, uh, a chat bot. Maybe you uh, ought to ask, have I ever used a chat box? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Get, get a little think, bit more I basic. Think, I think come back here. <laughs> I'll come back here. Yeah. Mm. So, if, if, if any of you have ever used, I'll relieve you on this one here, but I'll provoke you on some other questions <laughs> as we go. Have, if you have ever used a chatbot, um, and I just happened to look Spice FM up, mm. uh, specifically Situation Room, and it's interesting what it was talking about, because in one case, one of those chatbots, chatbots does not believe Ndu is female. It insists there are three men here, and Du is a lawyer coming from somewhere, and it insists. I asked for pictures. It gives up. I mean, it's it's an misogyny interesting thing. personified. I think <laughs> even this chat box well, is uh, you know, patriarchal so, society. Or exactly. Anything, so to the point, um, <laughs> if I was, in, this is a publicly available free uh, service from this chatbot, but. Let's say you're providing a service to your clients who require or use this data for very specific use cases, which can be legally binding. Mm. And you produce information that is not, or this system produces information that's accurate. Um, Ndu is already bringing another a lawsuit into this kind of a situation. Yeah, my representation <laughs> is to my right. Yeah, right? <laughs> so that, that has, ha has a capability of really... Um, affecting the um, confidence of that system, but also could have repercussions even financially. So how do you manage that? It has to be a very carefully managed uh, uh, pipeline of how you manage that data. And really data is the key. Yes. It starts with data. In fact, when I'm going to be describing what Dell Technology is doing in this area, mm -hmm. we really focus on a key area which we have been doing for decades. You know, Dell is a 40-year-old uh, company. Uh, most of that time, we've really been managing data for customers. In fact, most of the critical data in this world is actually on Dell systems. Um, in storage, backup, and things like this, archiving. Mm -hmm. But how you manage that data into then being able to produce um, tangible, credible, trustworthy information through this almost autonomous system is very key. Because otherwise, your internal staff, your customers, basically, when you don't trust that system, it's not going to be used. Okay. And, the, and thus, it's useless based mm. on how much investment you've put in there. And there's a lot of investment that, that goes into these systems. Yeah. Before, before we go to a break, I want you to start to introduce us to some of the solutions that we are talking about. Uh -huh. What are some of these things that we are talking about that this intelligence, which you've already established, mm -hmm. then is making bare that we can now say, this is a solution this is a mechanism providing this solution that you know that dell is involved in even today okay so one of the things i left out about ai mm. is that it's really a general purpose uh 
technology solution. When I say general purpose, I like to, I've had this mentioned, by the way, that it's akin to electricity, mm. the way electricity came, in, came about, right? So there's a lot of resistance, doubt, they, it's dangerous and all this. In fact, we are in that stage, mm. stage right now. But when I say general purpose is that it's going to be used in unimaginable ways. We can't really even say these are the three ways or 20 or 1 million ways you can use it because it's really going to be embedded in everything. So what is the solution for AI? Really what we're talking about here is how do you drive AI within your organization and incorporate it into your uh, processes, into your products and into your services. This is actually then mostly a service but it's driven by infrastructure. Mm. So Dell is in the space as a technology uh, vendor. And we talk about end-to-end -end technologies that we've been doing for decades, right? For mm -hmm. data center solutions, endpoint solutions. Some of them are here on the, in the studio. Mm -hmm. um, endpoints where basically you are using, or uh, users, myself, I'm using an endpoint mm -hmm. to that's the most productive tool today in business, which is your laptop or your tablet and things like that. Also this. known as endpoint. Also only okay. known as an endpoint. Okay. Also known as an edge device. Okay. But this is how humans interface with technology, mostly. Of course, we have mobile devices, but this is these are the most productive. Mm. From there all the way into what those devices are connecting to in some form of data center, whether it's here or in the cloud. That whole system is where actually AI is running on. And to be able to do that, you need compute power, you need storage, you need networking, you need data protection, you need security, but also you need skill. Mm -hmm. That package together is an AI solution. Right, okay. So we'll be talking about basically what Dell is doing in that space. Uh, Bernard Wanjao is with us this morning from Dell Technologies and we're trying to understand some of these things and it's very interesting for me because you know we thought of it before as it is a phone. <laughs> I pick up the call or I dial, I go. It's a laptop, it's a tab, I finish my work, I send it off in an email, that's it. But now you're introducing us to a different concept where you're saying this is an endpoint that all this technology has taken place. There's been an input of data. There's been the application of the intelligence. And this is now the end point yeah. of all of this into now some tangible solutions for things that may have posed as issues before. Now, I'm, we all are curious as to what exactly some of these things are. Mm -hmm. What problems would we have before that now Dell is giving us solutions in this space for learning? Okay, good question. So, endpoint, I know I, I dropped that. <laughs> and it's, it's really actually a very common industry term mm. in terms of where the technology actually meets the user. Mm. Um, and that could be the laptops, the desktop computers, the tablets, the mobile phones. Um, it can be other things like your virtual reality glasses, which mm -hmm. are now becoming mainstream. Yep. Um, it can be um, edge devices as well. We also call them edge devices. So edge devices is basically where your the human is interacting with the technology. So an edge, I'll take it further, an edge device could be even the vehicle. That's an edge device. Mm -hmm. You're interacting there physically with this technology. Um, it's also where the human being, the consumer, besides taking in, is also inputting um, their their own content into the system. Right. So this is where we're getting pictures coming in. We are typing content and all those kind of things. Right. And this all comes together into really data moving between in in various forms between uh, storage systems or data systems and the users who are using that data for something. And we're trying to figure out from an industry perspective using AI, which now coming back to this is, how do we most effectively use these huge amounts of data that are being accumulated yeah. on a daily, every minute? Right now we are discussing with this video running. Um, there's already AI that's in play because we can have someone trans transcribing this conversation yeah. live, mm. right? In fact, uh, one of your 
media outlets that you're doing this streaming to is is YouTube. YouTube yeah. has AI running on it, mm. which is actually able to transcribe live without you anyone having to type this information out yeah. uh, later in form of captions and things like captions, that. Captions, exactly. Right. Okay. Right? But then, what do you do with that uh, with with that transcription? That's data that can be used to search later. So keywords. There was a topic about endpoint, and it will come out because it's been indexed. All this is happening together, but it's not being thrown away. Mm -hmm. It's being stored. Later on, we need to then use this intelligently to be able to come up with um, solutions and services for for users that are trying to do something with. Um, you know, whatever they're, they're trying to do, research, they're trying to create a, a, a system that is able to describe what what has uh, Situation Room been doing this year, mm -hmm. right? That kind of a thing. And and if I put it on the on my chatbot, and hopefully it's I'm using the right prompting, mm -hmm. um, it should be able to summarize to me this year or this month. This is what has happened. This is what Ndu's input was. Uh, CT made this kind of. Uh, you know, uh, statements mm -hmm. and those kind of, th see, that's all data that's, right. that's available. Mm -hmm. But it's been analyzed and um, structured in a way that is searchable. If I could interject. Yeah. That vis-a-vis -vis what we would have to do before where uh -huh. you would need to have one person who is sifting through hours and hours and hours of footage, yeah. hours of, you know, audio to be able to find themes. So what we're saying is if you use the right kind of language, yes. for example, you input it and it will then automatically generate for you what these themes have been over time. Exactly. And so that's where you see the solution, that it's time saving, uh, resource saving and probably resource efficiency and practicability when it comes to looking for something. That's exactly right. And in fact, now let's talk about a practical use case yeah. on this. So I talked about how y you have guests coming in, mm -hmm. experts. Um, subject matter uh, experts in various fields and you as a team are there trying to extract some information from them mm -hmm. um, and you also need to make sure obviously that what is coming back to you is factual mm -hmm. something that your audience can actually use but then you're not experts in necessarily in those fields mm -hmm. but how do you then ensure that really what is being discussed is relevant it's true and um, it's also current, right? Yeah. So you have some endpoints in front of you there, Andu, for instance. Yes. City is having an endpoint as well. Julie is having also an endpoint there. Yeah. This may be there waiting for you to input something, but also they could be actively listening in and doing the transcription, but also doing the cross-referencing. So when I say, for instance, Dell is a 40-year-old company, mm -hmm. um, it's a 102 billion annual revenue company, and we are growing as well at a rate of, let's say, 10% quarter mm -hmm. on quarter. Mm -hmm. Those are facts. Mm -hmm. But then, as I'm saying this, um, it should be something flagging or green saying, okay, everything that's being said here is actually factual mm -hmm. because it's cross referencing information. It's going to the Dell website, it's looking at the financial reporting, it's looking at various information that's actually out there in the public domain mm. because then you'll be able to catch wait a minute you're saying this but you're saying you deployed this yeah. but it's not actually online mm. because it's clearly saying that um, nothing has been deployed in this area in fact we we have satellite images right mm. now that are showing it doesn't exist mm -hmm. you know a project was created we have already deployed we've commissioned it it's yeah. live it's going everything is working great right so those kind of uh, uh, situation awareness. Mm. <laughs> ah, I see what you did there, <laughs> and I like it. <laughs> so, so you see how, okay, so this is, this is uh, an example of how the technology can come to bear, mm. because really the information is already there. Yeah. What you are missing, mm. which is to, to your question earlier, mm. is what solution can we bring to bear to be able to then enable you to be using those, that kind of uh, technology. Right. That's where Dell comes in. Mm -hmm. Now, a quick introduction to mm. Dell. Mm. Right? So many of your users may know Dell as the PC, laptop yes. company. Mm -hmm. And there's good reason for that. 
uh, we are much, much more than this, but this is where our uh, beginnings were from an uh, organization perspective. Yeah. So Dell, the man, the founder of, mm -hmm. of Dell Technologies, mm -hmm. uh, back in 1984, started actually building PCs, mm -hmm. assembling them in his garage. Started off with a thousand US dollars and just started his small company and started building PCs. His vision was basically to ensure that technology is available to all in a cost-effective, reliable, um, and quick manner. Mm -hmm. So fast forward, he uh, deployed the first e-commerce uh, uh, platform to sell PCs. So you can basically go online. Yeah. At the advent, this was early days of internet. Go online and actually just order your PC and it's delivered to you. This was different from how things were being done before, where you have to go to the shop, look at it, okay, it will come, you come pick it up, or things like those, right? It was a different paradigm, but it was supposed to be really democratizing technology, yeah. availing it to everyone. Fast forward to today. Um, I mentioned already the size of the company yeah. today, annually. Um, Dell has 133,000 uh, employees. Uh, around the world, 160 um, million units are basically shipped in the last three years alone in form of PCs, laptops, mm. servers, uh, storage systems, um, networking, backup uh, or data, data protection systems. So basically what I'm getting at is an end-to-end -end IT company, not just PCs. Okay. Um, most importantly, I think, besides the products, is also the services. In fact, out of the 133 uh, staff members that Dell has, most of them are actually in the services side, which is the support, R&D, and uh, deployment teams. Because really technology is how to use it as opposed to just having it. Having it. So we have a lot of technology on the table here. Like I said, a lot of it is passive. Mm -hmm. So, but how do we then make it active? How do you activate it? Yeah. This is the skill set okay. that comes into play. Um, so um, in terms of R&D, um, which is basically how we bring value to this. And I'll, I'll talk about that because AI is a lot of R&D involved in it. So in the last three years, for instance, Dell has invested $7.8 billion, mm. in this is factual, on r and I'll stop there just to mention that um, what we're doing on the AI space here, and we, we believe we are leading in this uh, initiative because organizations are trying to grapple with the question, how do I bring AI to bear mm -hmm. to my in my organization? I've given a couple of examples, even just here in the media, in the, in the situation room. So how do I do it? What we've done is really come up with a way to accelerate that journey mm -hmm. to get AI enabled within organizations okay. by doing what we have been doing quite a lot on other technologies, being able to deploy validated solutions. We package together what I mentioned, which is the computing capabilities, the storage capabilities, the security aspect of things. Mm -hmm how interconnect them together from a networking perspective, protection or the uh, data protection of the same, um, and the services, and package it together into a validated system that we can deploy, let's say here in standard group, yeah. with your IT team to start actually integrating AI into your daily operations. Now, that's just the infrastructure. What about the data? Mm. You already have a lot of data here both in form of digital format, but also maybe paper or analog or yeah. whatever you want to call it, right? That archives. needs to be digitized. Archives. Yeah. A lot of archives, mm. right? I mean, I would say probably when we, we say data is oil, a place like this has huge amount of especially historical. Yes. And historical is really wealth because you get to start doing trending predictions because of various things that are uh, recognized within the historical aspect that we even we haven't thought about. Mm -hmm. There are patterns to this. Droughts, um, health issues, and all those kind of things. Initiatives that were tried, didn't work, what happened, what are the lessons learned. All this is documented and it's in the archives. Mm -hmm. 
how do you be able to how are you able to then bring that data curate it store it in a way that is accessible to that infrastructure for the ai uptake it analyze it create a model and in fact don't even create your own model mm. use already created model and adapt it to use your data yeah so <clears throat> chat gpt for instance is using internet data mm -hmm. um but it's a model that can be used to um actually use your own information to be able to then provide you a chatbot that gives you uh your own domain data your own domain answers so for instance city can go and find out okay what has what's the historical um uh nature of this particular subject in kenya mm -hmm. or within africa give yes. it up some parameters yeah but within your own archive it's all going to go outside so if that search result remains for you it's for you okay. and it's your proprietary okay product mm -hmm. right that can be also be given as a service to the public because a lot of the information there may not actually be out in the internet mm. this is your own um let's say proprietary data this is your own uh collection or your own data that you've stored and you have curated it yourself i can see how that would be a solution yeah. how would you guarantee that that information that you're receiving then is factual okay so already the good news is mm. giving this example taking it further that a media house like this already has those processes in place mm. so your journalists already have their own ways of fact checking fact checking yeah. before they publish <laughs> one would hope you yeah, well <laughs> <laughs> right yes. so there already there are those processes in place yes. um there is another angle to this which is if you have a model that's running here there is nothing that stops you from using another model f that could be a public one to fact check your own mm. actually you can basically then have a community of ais that fact check each other fa mm. fact check each other mm. in fact that's the thinking now in the field because that's really an issue whereby sometimes even the data internally may not be accurate so you need to have different perspectives coming in from various systems but removing the human a bit out of it because of the speed and breadth of the limitations of what human can do and mm -hmm. i'm not saying that in a bad way but the 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 systems the computing environment that we are having today is just much more capable than a human brain mm -hmm. as we know today is able to able to, able to digest all this information and really analyze it quickly. Mm -hmm. So other models can be actually used that could be here or outside. They can be used to just fact check according to what is the common knowledge about this kind of topic. And then that that can happen. And this can happen instantaneously really. Mm. So what I'm getting at is how do you get from where we are today at Standard Group but this could be a bank that's trying to figure out how to do fraud detection this could be a telco that's trying to figure out how to what's the next service it needs to really push mm -hmm. out to the customers based on the sentiments today of these customers on their current services all kinds of diff it could be in healthcare it could be in agriculture in fact we have use cases in all those areas that not use cases customer stories of mm -hmm. how they've actually been able to bring this to bear um so we provide a fast accelerated way and a really simplified way for organizations your IT team your data scientists to be able to bring that capability to bear mm. we call them dell ai validated solutions mm. so those are a packaged uh a package solution that includes also capacity building because once we deploy this besides working with you on the journey we need to make sure your staff is able to also maintain it mm -hmm. so there is no including educational services um so the full pipeline the full pipeline and then the life cycle management of that environment it's an always growing uh um uh, solution mm -hmm. because you're having to maintain it and having to ensure that it's staying accurate um and there's no um let's say deviations that are happening because of bad data coming in or bad sources that are coming in and also it's secure there are no bad actors that are coming in to manipulate mm. or steal your intellectual 
right. right? So that solution, uh, we do it from a Dell Technologies because we're able to do the whole end-to-end -end aspect of it. Mm. Your journalists are using endpoints today. Yes. Um, that could be AI enabled or not. Maybe not, because really what we're bringing to bear some of these systems, like the laptop you're seeing here, mm. has already AI capability within it. Mm -hmm. um, everything from how it's doing its security, where it knows when I'm looking at it on the screen. If I'm looking away to you, Julie, or to, do or to CT, the screen can actually dim itself so that I'm not having anyone else seeing what I'm doing mm. when I'm at the airport, I'm traveling. These are mobile devices, right? Yes. So, um, and how it's optimizing itself. Battery usage, because, you know, uh, those are issues on, on those mobile devices. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Everything you say sounds good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sounds, in fact, very, 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 very good. But this is where we are now. Where are we going? Okay. Various ways of answering this. Um, and uh, I have to put some caveat. <laughs> so, City, if you're bringing any kind of philosophical aspect to this, I will have to come back to Albert Einstein. <laughs> okay. Actually, I am letting you do the thinking All right. and determining how you're going to respond. <laughs> yeah. You didn't ask how Einstein comes I am, I'm not prefacing <laughs> anything. Yes. Okay. Very well. Yes. We've covered that point. Mm. Where are we going with this? Mm. Okay, so um, innovation, I think it's human nature. The, the last big innovation in technology, if I could ask the, the presenters here, mm. who can probably just mention what was the last big innovation uh, Let's say what what popped the last time that you can remember was big news and, and all this, right? That impacted a lot of people. Poof, the internet. Something internet. About the internet. The the electric vehicle. A big the electric thing? vehicle. A mobile phone. Mobile phone, particularly like which one? <laughs> the one that started this whole smartphones and. You want me to name the company? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. So there's, there's the smartphone, Yeah, right? the smartphone itself. Okay. Yeah. So um, the innovation aspect of human beings, especially in areas which are relatively easy to innovate, mm. is something which is second nature. What we've been having all along has been computers. And you've been seeing how the performance of these systems have just been increasing and increasing and increasing year after year. Mm. In fact, there's a law for it. It's called Moore's Law. Yeah. Where computing power will double every, right? But then what do you do with this? Because then there was this aspect of what more could we do? Mm. Um, so we've discovered that these systems can actually start emulating the human brain in terms of the computational pro data mm. processing capabilities. Mm -hmm. And the human brain is not a small fit. I mean, we are getting a lot of sensory information. We're thinking about things simultaneously. Some multitask better than others. But then how, why not then start using the, the compute power that is starting to emulate a lot of what, how our processes, our own biological processes of thinking, mm -hmm. then to do more for us. Um, and when you do more, then we could gain more. Mm. So it could be a capitalistic approach, but also it could be convenience, productivity, all the, that aspect of things. Mm. So we are driving, really. It's a natural urge to be able to push the boundaries to see what this can do. Mm. The, I think, advantage of AI, in this case, which could be different from, let's say, 5G, we, that was another one, you know, 4G, then 5G and all those, right? And you can hear like, okay, that can, tends to have a peak and then starts topping, uh, kind of bottoming out, right? Yeah. But it's there, but it's just not as it, exciting. That is true of all mm. technologies. Mm. It, it's true of all technologies. Finds but its way down. what's happening is that I said this is general purpose. So we are finding that we are able to apply this AI 
way of or this technology to be able to, in, in various devices, mm -hmm. not just our computers, not just our phones, but in various other things. Yeah. So way forward. Or what's where are we leading to? Mm -hmm. We're Perhaps leading to answer the yeah, question yeah. and way forward. Yeah. yeah. There are two great conversations <laughs> in the world. I know, but I need uh, um, Bernard to answer that question because we are seconds going to Sofia. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're going to be discovering more and more ways mm. that I can't even actually even imagine myself. Mm. More and more ways to apply this um, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to really creating new things. Mm. Mm. Right? I'm concerned about the caution. And that's where we're going. Yes. Creating new things. The ethics of the, AI. The caution regulation. Of it, yeah. The limitations mm -hmm. of all of this. So the concerns are real. Consequences. And yeah. those are the conversations that I think that we now then get into and how it's going to affect us human beings yes. and what we can actually do to make to, you know, take advantage and also go forward. Exactly. Bernard Wanjiao is the Data Center Solutions Specialist at Dell Technologies, has been our guest this hour talking about AI. Thank you so much for being here this morning. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day.